Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to the second week of class for School of the East, uh, winter quarter, 2023. And if you were with me for last week's lesson, you know that I had an experience some mechanical problems. I'm not the most uh, computer savvy guy, so uh, I can't troubleshoot these things and then they get busy. So these uh, problems have continued for this week, but since you only see my face for a very short time, I think it's quite minor. You need to be able to uh, read the lecture and then hear me speaking. So without further ado, this is uh, for the second week class for 1-16-2023, okay? So let me follow with the usual procedures here. Okay. Start the slideshow. From the beginning, and the further information, if you've forgotten, since it is only the second week, this is English 107, your school code, English composition, and reading, kind of a fusion class, more for you to learn about, more for you to enjoy. And as I said, it's scheduled for January the 16th. 2023, if you're not quite used to the new year yet. And as you see here, it was since week two. Okay. So here we go. We have to define audience and purpose, right? If a college instructor told you to just write a paper, what would you do? No other directions, just write a paper. That's it, write a paper, do what I say. Okay. How would you proceed? Would you just sit down and begin writing whatever came to mind, such as the latest prospects for the local football team or how much you dislike the classic band Steely Dan? Now you see how tough this is, that's probably my experience with uh, students such as yourselves, just say, hey, write whatever you want. It's a tough thing to do because you have to be 100% creative for a lot of students. They'd rather be told, tell me, teacher, what to write about, even if it's about hot dogs or snakes, right? Um, you probably don't remember Steely Dan anyway, because that was... Wow. Kid, yeah. So even if you start writing, how would you know you what you were going to get a good rate on the paper? You wouldn't, you couldn't. Unless you were paying under the table, right? Huh. So why? Because you have no idea what the expectations of the assignment are, who the writing is for. Do not know the audience or the purpose of the writing assignment. And that's what makes it really hard also. <laughs> you have to define audience and purpose. Uh, it's your audience, senior citizens, your audience, young people from kids to 25. And then why are you writing this paper? You have to define the purpose. All right. Let's proceed. What is an audience? All audiences, whether you're in a movie, which means watching, reading a book, watching an advertiser or an ad, or listening in a classroom, expect the same three things. To learn something, 
to be entertained. Yes, that is a step in there. So students don't remember that or don't feel that that's true, but it is true it's to be entertained. I think I touched on that last week. To feel that whoever is delivering the message knows that what he, she, or they is are talking about. That's very important too. That's why we have people that are classified as experts. They get paid a lot because they're experts. So in the case of the writing, people will know as they read your writing if you really don't know, excuse me, what the hell you're talking about. They can pick that up. So you don't want that to be the case, you know? And of course, to feel their time is not being wasted. It's also something very important. So again, touching on if you're writing about something you don't really don't know, like I don't know anything about astrophysics, okay? And if you told me to, uh, or forced me to write a paper on astrophysics, I think it would probably sound pretty bad and people would know pretty quickly reading it. This man is not what the hell he's talking about. You don't want to pick a topic like that. You don't want people to feel that their time is being wasted. And finally here, to clearly receive the information they thought they were going to receive. So again, that's another thing. Maybe they know something about the topic. So they have a pretty good expectation of what kind of information they should read about. They're hoping you can add some new tidbits for them, but the majority of what you're going to have to say, they kind of know. So this goes along. It's going to be coupled together with like wasting their time. If you tell them a bunch of weird stuff, they're going to say, hey, we didn't receive the information. We thought we were. What is this guy talking about? Okay, so be careful of those things. Some people just think that if they just write, 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 that's the that will fill the requirement, but that's not the case. Uh, here on the bottom left, in writing, this means that we all agree that we want something that's clean. Okay. In terms of formatting, like the font size doesn't suddenly change sizes. That's pretty funny. Like a big font to a small font. Easy to read. And that's in terms of grammar, punctuation, and spelling. You don't want a bunch of smell, uh, smelling, spelling, this errors, and punctuation. People are going to say, was that sausage or sausage? Because it was spelled different both times. Let's organize well. Yes, follow those steps. Organize your paper well. So I'll talk about the bottom part up front. And then the top is put in the middle, right? You got to make it clear and interesting. Maybe a little funny. It doesn't have to be very funny. You're not writing a gag man speech. And then hopefully it's a useful point. Again, something they can learn and put into use. Most people really like reading things like that. I had a woman write a paper before and she had to come up and talk about it in front of class, pitch the idea. And it was about how to lose weight after 30. Boy, everybody was ready to listen to that. They wanted to learn at least one thing. So think about those kinds of things and the audience you're looking for. Okay, next, different audiences will warm or start to like, that's what warm means two different styles. Some audiences will expect to see evidence of detailed and careful research, such as a supervisor. However, not all audiences like the same things. It's true. Those aspects of us that make us different are demographics, right? Like LA is gonna have a lot of demographics. What are they gonna have? Young people, senior citizens. There's an area called K-Town, so they're going to have Koreans. 
there's an area where there's a lot of Mexicans and Mexicans that might be put together with Latinos because there's an area with a lot of Salvadorans, with black folks, so white folks. There's a lot of demographics in LA. So here we go with this breakdown here on the page. Age, race, like I mentioned, gender, which is a big issue now with people saying things like I have a gender. Or maybe you're going to write a paper specifically for those kinds of folks. Personality. There's a lot of different kinds of personality. Some are patient and quiet. Some like to yell. So they're different. Socioeconomic status. That means you could be talking about poor people, middle class, or rich, or even be super rich. Then there's morals which means some people maybe have a religious background and would not steal or cuss at people. And other people, that's not important to them. They're gonna, you know, they cuss all the time or they don't mind stealing. So education level, again, people with no education, maybe only an elementary school education, high school, you know, diploma, maybe college. And it may be a master's degree, right? Okay, then where we're from, part of the country, everybody's different from different parts of the country. You're from Texas, and then you talk like you're from Texas. You're from uh, Boston, and you're going to pack the can, and you're going to sound different. In politics, could be an independent, could be a Republican, could be a Democrat. And then religion. A lot of different religions here. You could be Buddhist, Christian, Muslim, Jewish, you name it. Or like some students, they believe in the hamburger. You know, as long as they have a hamburger, everything's okay. okay next. Whew. This is why there are so many different magazines in the world. If you ever thought about it, they're trying to uh, hit as many audiences as they can. Sure, anyone can pick up any magazine and read it. But publishers of magazines have always had target audience in mind. You can think of a variety of magazines and imagine what their target audience might be. The audience for Field and Stream, which is a, um, if I remember, I know the stream part is for fishermen. They like fishing in lakes. Uh, not in the ocean. And then field, I think it's for hunters, from like cup and things like that. So that audience is different uh, than the audience for Cosmopolitan, which was originally for young, hip women to older women, talking about women's issues and interests. And then much different than Dollhouse Miniatures Magazine, which uh, it's all ages, believe it or not, but some people collect dollhouse miniatures and it's very important that they have certain pieces and set up the house the way that they should look perfectly and beautifully. Well, these are three different kinds of audience. And this isn't an accident. Next, what does this mean for your writing? You should always have a target audience in mind when you're writing, which I mentioned before. This audience is a specific demographic group, such as West High School seniors or incoming freshmen at Central College. And you should think about what they know about your topic and what might also be most interesting to them. Also think about what style of writing and tone would most appeal to them. Again, if you want have a lot of exclamation points and yelling and things like that. It might be to a real young teenage audience. Just like they like, like let's say, rock and roll loud music, where older people don't like that anymore. Next, the more you know about your audience, the better decisions you make in your writing. It's true because that's, you know, let's say it's kind of like a, Dating. If you want to date a certain person and you could find out beforehand 
as many things as you could of what that person likes, then you probably have a much better chance of having a better date with that person than if you knew nothing, because I mean, you probably wouldn't touch on so many things. But if you knew that, let's say you wanted to take this pretty woman out and you found out what her favorite food was, well, then it's pretty easy to plan a restaurant that she's going to like the food. And then if you found out which restaurant she likes, then it'd be even more easy, right? Then you find out what kind of movies she liked, what kind of flowers she liked, right? Now you're making all these great, important points. Pretty good chance you'll have a good time, even though it's secret information, okay? But like it says here, the more you know about your audience, the better decisions you make in your writing. For example, let's say you want to use a television show on aliens to explain how humans view the unknown. If your audience grew up in the 1950s through the 1970s, you might use the Twilight Zone as an example. If your audience came of age in the 80s or 90s, the X-Files is more appropriate for a contemporary audience. Stranger things might be fitting examples Word choice, tone, style, these all should tailor to your audience. Interesting, a temporary. I have never seen Stranger Things. It must be on a cable show that I don't have. So no, I sound strange, right? Uh, one thing you don't want to do is think about your audience, the group of people you are addressing as in a letter. But remember that it says things you don't want to kind of put those together. You don't want to address them within the letter. And here's the example. Don't write an essay that starts with something like single mothers, this essay is for you. No, or no sir, no senor. In fact, don't mention the audience at all in the essay itself. Simply consider what they know already and what they need to know, and don't spend a bunch of time on stuff they already know. Spend more time on what they need to know. So like I said before, people love to learn new things, okay? So let's say you wanna write a sports piece on the hmm, LA Lakers. Okay, so if you're writing that for LA Lakers fans, uh, maybe some are very knowledgeable. So first of all, you have to be careful not to make mistakes. But second, when you can let them know something, like an uh, example would be like maybe know something about LeBron before he arrives with the Lakers. And it's a new tidbit of information for them. Uh, they probably really enjoy that. Right? then they would actually want to spend more time on the, the fighters. So, yeah, think about those things. All right. Okay. Audience wants and needs, as you can see right here. One thing to keep in mind when you're writing is what might motivate or move your audience. This goes back to what I said about knowing secret information about the person you're going to have a date with. The American psychologist Abraham Maslow described this as the hierarchy of needs, which I'm sure you say it's in a triangle is what it is. The most important thing is at the top. Okay. He characterized what most humans want or need in five broad characters. Uh, categories. The most important section are physiological needs. Uh, okay, what that being said is, and it's obviously true, and I'll give you a you know, typical crazy example, but it's true. That way you don't forget it. That's why I give crazy examples. You might uh, love 
Uh, again, we'll go back to hamburgers. Let's say burritos. You might love burritos more than anything in the world, but that doesn't mean you need burritos to live. You might mentally, but physiolo uh, physiologically, your body, you, what you need is oxygen first, okay? Then probably water. You need water. You can go longer without food than water, okay? So you have to see these are important needs. More important than just, I have to have a burrito a day. Okay. Next, it needs of survival. Okay, so that's usually um, shelter or a place to live, right? And you just can't wander the street without the bad things happening to you. If you have your own shelter, you would have a way of surviving. Or even the elements can kill you, not just crazy people. Then safety needs, which again, shelter will provide that. Then emotional needs, they have to put that into. Do you have a friend? Do you have a boyfriend or a girlfriend? A lot of people will come to me and say, you know, well, I think the number one killer, and that's how I used to think, let's say of a senior citizen is uh, heart disease, let's say that, right? And then two is maybe uh, well, the heart disease can come from smoking, let's say. And two is maybe alcohol and all this. And actually, I found out the actual number one killer, get ready. Again, we're talking about emotional needs here of senior citizens living in the big city, living in downtown LA. It's loneliness, absolute loneliness. So emotional needs are important. Then psychological needs, right? What keeps you mentally happy? And then personal needs, and everyone has a little uh, personal way about doing things, right? I have a friend, and um, you know, he's a single guy. He's been single his whole adult life. Never been married, never lived with a woman. I don't even know if he's had a girlfriend. But anyway, I would think he would be so lonely that he'd be terrible. But somehow, he has a giant cable dish. He loves watching all kinds of shows from all over the world. He doesn't cook for himself and loves ordering pizza from Pizza Hut and Domino's. And somehow, those two things... Maybe donuts are coming in there now. He gets older, but they take care of most of his personal needs. You know? But that might not be the case for other people. They might need to have a boyfriend or a girlfriend. I uh, need to go to church. Need to be close to their family. You know, etc. Right? All right. Here's a triangle I talked about. You know, it's a self-actualization. Esteem, love, and belonging, safety, psychological. Just to let you know, you don't have to remember these. I'm going to be kind. This is not a behavioral science class. These are only used as examples. Okay, Good, to, good stuff to know. Uh, weaved into trying to find our audience in our writing class and reading. So again, in the self-actualization, we have morality, which I talked about, creativity, spontaneity problem solving, lack of prejudice, and acceptance of facts. You know that that's the, um, and it makes sense. That's the first thing that happens when someone goes to the doctor at whatever age and the doctor says, well, for example, you have cancer. Uh, it's stage four, which is the most severe. If you don't know, there's stages one, two, three, and four. And a doctor says it's stage four, and I diagnose that you're going to die within the year. Okay. First thing is most people cannot accept it. It's just one day they're fine and planning their life, and it doesn't matter, doesn't matter what their age. They could be 70 years old, not like you guys in your 20s, and they're still planning their life. And the doctor says within a year it's over. So most people can't accept that. It takes a while to get out of that stage. 
just to let you know that. Um, okay, so then we have esteem, which is self-esteem, confidence. Everybody needs confidence so at a certain level. Some people have confidence on certain issues and then on others they don't. Uh, achievement, some people need to achieve some things. Uh, respect of others, that's also important. And then respect by others. So it's, it's healthy to respect other people and say, hey, you know, like, for example, you know, I'm not talking bad about a friend that somehow survives on cable, satellite, and pizzas. I, I do, for the one fact, uh, respect him a lot because he uh, has work. He works a lot. Maybe that's part of his thing. He, he'll work overtime like you don't believe. I just spoke to him recently, and he worked about uh, Christmas, which most people don't want to do, New Year's Eve. And he gets like time and a half double pay for this. So with that money, he takes complete care of himself. He doesn't, I'm sure everybody has a friend that goes around and asks for money, right? He takes complete care of himself. So on that, I have to respect him a lot. Then we have the love and belonging. Again, it could be friendship. It could be family. family. Oh, dear, sexual intimacy. That's where the boyfriend and girlfriend thing come into play. Then we have safety, security of body, of employment, of resources, of morality, the family, of health, and property for you, homeowners. And then physiological. Breathing, food, water, sex, sleep. Sleep is also important. You can go crazy without a lot of sleep. And it destroys your body. Homostasis and excretion. Talk about that. Okay, let's continue. Get on more with our subject, what we're learning in this quarter. Okay. By appealing to the needs and wants of your audience, you can be more Effective writer. You know, we're back in the writing mode. Yay. This applies to any kind of writing from entertaining essays. There's that entertaining again. Don't forget that. That's the kind of question that's going to come up. And you can say, I don't know what the answer is. Oh, you can write for entertainment. Oh, which might include jokes, jokes that appeal to an audience's ideas about love and belonging, to persuasive essays that might pull on basic needs like water or the safety of children. A lot of people write paper like that, or even uh, things like the importance that you must know about smog, like in LA, especially during the summer, smog in LA is the worst in the country. What kind of effects would that have on your health and your children that you don't even really think about, right? Now it's leading the audience. Where are you leading them to? Where are you taking them to? That's important. Goal of writing is either to manipulate an audience, take them someplace, trip, or to work with the audience. Aristotle said writers should pull their audience along using personal presence, logic, and emotion. Ethos, pathos, logos. Again, you're not going to have to know those Greek terms of being kind. A good writer can play readers, draw them along, and lead them to a pre-planned conclusion. But this all depends on knowing the audience well and knowing English well. And really, that's the basic goal of a good story, right? You want to excite them in the beginning, keep them interesting in the middle, and then take them on the way to the conclusion of your paper, which should be the, the most exciting part, right? That's what they've been dying to find out. Okay, in the middle here, what are pathos, I mean, excuse me, ethos, pathos, and logos? These are simply words we use to describe the methods of appealing to an audience. Ethos means you are appealing to an audience by your credentials. You know, you're a very uh, published and famous writer, so people will come initially to read your work. Uh, Stephen King. All you got to do is say, hey, who wrote this new book? Oh, it's a Stephen King. Oh, I got to read it. You know, he's the man in the horror genre. Then your status, put that there. Your virtue, your knowledge. Some people, let's say, uh, 
Stephen King, you know, he's really good at writing the scary stuff. But a lot of that stuff he's making up, he's making up monsters and creatures and ghosts and you name it. But then other people that write like historical novels, people love their knowledge. I say like James Michener writes about early Hawaiians, people that know about these things or history, and then they see, wow, this guy really studied his stuff. You know, he knows what he's talking about. That's also a respect for your knowledge as a writer. Pathos means you're appealing to an audience by emotion. Oh, by invoking rage, which is your anger is so strong that you cannot stop it. A lot of times leads into violence of some kind. Like the person picking up the chairs at the restaurant, throwing them about. That's a rage that's beyond being angry. Uh, fear. Love. Anybody talk about love anymore? I don't It was a time that love novels and romance novels were so popular. Jesus Christ. I don't hear about that anymore. And then pity, pity is when you feel really, really sorry for someone, you know, like a person born with a birth defect or something and the like. And logos means you're appealing to an audience by reason, that is by giving facts, by giving statistics, by a, giving logical argumentation and common sense. This logo again, um, I've had a lot of people write papers like this. And, uh, for example, these kind of papers fall in the category of people trying to get you, let's say, to stop smoking. Now, it's not enough. You just can't put an argument. So I think it's bad to smoke, people are going to say. Well, so what? You know, uh, everybody has a different opinion. But. If you give facts, and you give statistics, huh? what's the percentage of people that die every year from smoke-related death? Or you give facts how many people are sick by smoking, and then you make it logical and common sense, then you'll get a lot of readers. You know, again, you just cannot put forward a statement saying, I don't like some. You've got to back it up. Let's look at how ethos, pathos, and logos works in terms of audience with an example. Example, you're trying to persuade your mother to let you go on a study abroad trip for a semester. You need to come up with arguments and evidence that are made specifically with your mom in mind because you know her. You know what kind of arguments work on her and which don't. All my friends are going would not cut it. She doesn't want to hear that. But what if all your friends are stupid, she's going to say, so you can't say that. You know your mom better than anyone. Next. You know which commercials make her tear up. That means cry. The ones with sick babies and kids graduating from college. You know, she doesn't trust. Online news sources, right? Everything's fake news nowadays. By considering these factors, you can give the best argument and persuade her to let you go to parents. I mean, pa Paris, right? So again, Manipulate your audience. Take them where you think they want to go. Here's how we would apply ethos, pathos, and logos to this example. Ethos is the way of convincing your audience through credibility and character. You display to your mother that you have done well in college. You have been on the honor roll and have been responsible. You also have a letter from your history professor who recommended you for the program, aka TRIP. Pathos is a way of convincing your audience by appealing to the motions. You remind your mother of how she's always telling you about that trip to Germany she took when she was in high school. How it opened up her eyes to the wonders of uh, the world. And that was only two weeks. You imagine what six months in France would do. So you say, Mom, you went and loved it. And you constantly tell me about it. I think I should have the same experience like you. And this being longer, I will have even a better time and it will affect my life even stronger, right? You appeal to her in that frame, not just I want to go. Everybody wants to go. Sounds like fun. Next, Logos is a way of convincing your audience by providing factual support and data. You display to your mother that 
Researchers independent of international study abroad programs found that college students who study abroad have higher graduation and employment rates than students who do not study abroad. So there's a way you can manipulate her with that. You say, this is the kind of stuff that looks great on a resume. So if your friend went and has this on the resume that they spent six months independently in Europe, in France, and then you did not go and you just had your regular school information, they would probably get the job over you. So you have to appeal to her mommy in that way. Next, there are other, also other ways to discuss how we persuade. Organizing the various methods of persuasion into ethos, pathos, and logos is very common, but another way is to use the following categories. Appeal to authority. Everybody high ranking thinks it's a good idea. Next, appeal to facts. Basically, this is logos. Appeal to emotion. Basically, this is pathos. Appeal to trust. Basically, this is part of ethos. And then the old bandwagon. Now, that might be a tricky one I might throw at you on that question. Everyone else agrees, public opinion, common sense. All right. It used to be, um, when I was growing up, it used to be, hey, everyone agrees, it's public opinion, it's common sense. When you graduate college, if you spend two years in the Peace Corps, that's uh, a really good way to get guaranteed a job with a nice company. I like seeing that. I don't think that's the case anymore, but that's what it used to be. Next is purpose. To define your audience next, what's the purpose? Why are you writing? What do you seek to accomplish? You need to know your purpose. Why are you writing as well as to whom? If your car broke down on your way to class and you missed a quiz, you might need to write an email to your college instructor. You have an audience. Now, what is your purpose? It is to try to get a retake on the quiz. Is that it? Is it to take responsibility for missing the quiz and apologize? Is it to complain about how awful your week has been? Which one of these things is it? Knowing your purpose will help you prepare your writing and draft the best possible email to achieve your desired result. It might even involve research, looking at the syllabus for the class to review the instructor's policies and late or missed work. Next three, finding the main idea. In all good writing, there is a controlling thesis or message that connects all of the specific details and facts. This concept or idea is usually expressed as a generalization that summarizes the entire text. Good comprehension results when you are able to grasp this main message, even if you sometimes forget some of the details. That's what they say. You more or less remember the main idea. You might forget a date, you might forget a name or a small detail, but you understand after the reading that, okay, the reading is about a dog that runs away from home. Um, I don't remember the name of the monkey, but he becomes friends with a monkey. And then uh, they have many adventures traveling into Canada. I don't remember right now the cities they went through, but I know the dog left home. The dog's name is Yo-Yo. Uh, met a monkey friend. And they traveled into Canada. So you know more or less what's going on. When you understand the intent, you have a context in which to evaluate the reasoning, the attitude, whether the evidence cited or noted really is supportive of the conclusions drawn. And that's what you have to do. They have to support, you know. Again, you can't, like I said, the paper, you can't write a paper about that you should quit smoking. And then the things that you cite actually say, well, it's okay if you smoke or you really don't get cancer. Then they don't support anything in your paper. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, here we go in the middle. 
an obsession for facts can obscure the big picture or hide the big picture, giving you an understanding of the trees, but no concept of the forest. How many of you have spent hours studying for an important exam, collecting dates, names, terms, and formulas, but fail to ferret out or look out for the main idea, the underlying concept that is composed of these facts? In longer, more involved readings, many messages are combined to form a chain of thought, which in turn may or may not communicate one thesis or idea. That's a chain of thought. That's a little more risky to write, just to let you know, because the chain has to follow through. Next, your ability to capture the chain of thought determines your level of comprehension and what you retain right in your memory. Directing or dissecting. Dissecting means to cut up your reading assignment. So any of you that watch any of those, uh, I go. I can't remember the name now. But there's a bunch of the shows. There's those shows where the you know somebody gets killed and it's a police show and then they bring them in and they perform an autopsy. Well, when they perform an autopsy, they dissect your body. Okay. So here we go. To succeed in identifying the main idea in any reading assignment, you must learn to use these helpful tools. One, find the or identify the topic sentence of a paragraph. Two, summary sentences. Three, supporting sentences. Four, transitional statements. Next, as you learn to dissect your reading assignment paragraph by paragraph, Identifying its many parts and their functions. Again, that dissected falls into identifying here for our purposes. You'll grasp the main idea much more quickly and remember it longer. So those are tools to help you remember and increase your reading comprehension. Because if you can remember those things, like remember the topic sentence, you know, that's really going to help. So recognizing a topic sentence. Every paragraph has a topic sentence. The sentence that summarizes what the paragraph is about. Even if a paragraph does not have such a clearly stated sentence, it can be implied or inferred what is written. Generally, the topic sentence is the first or last sentence of a paragraph, the one statement that announces, here's what this paragraph is all about. When the topic sentence is obscured or hidden, you may need to utilize two simple exercises to uncover it. One. Pretend you're a headline writer for your local newspaper and write a headline for the paragraph you just read. Two, write a five word summary describing what the paragraph is about. You can begin your analysis by turning once again to our helpful questions. Is the passage written to address one of these questions? So the following will help you with that. One, who? The paragraph focuses on a particular person or group of people. The topic sentence tells you who this is. Two, when? The paragraph is primarily concerned with time. The topic sentence may even begin with the word when. Three, where? The paragraph is oriented around a particular place or location. The topic sentence states where you are reading about. We are reading about Mexico City, for example. And four, why? A paragraph that states reasons for some belief or happening usually addresses this question. The topic sentence answers why something is true or why an event happened. You know, you find out things like, let's say, in boxing, you have a favorite boxer that you follow, and let's just say he um, he just lost this important fight he had last Friday, wondered why he looked so bad. And then you find out he was hiding an injury that he couldn't cancel the fight for, or he didn't train correctly, or... He had emotional issues with his wife or something. So that these are the possible uh, 
wise. Okay. okay. And then how? The paragraph identifies the way something works or the means by which something is done. The topic sentence explains the how of what is described. You will notice that I didn't include the question, what, in this list. This is not an oversight. What addresses such a broad range of possibilities that asking this question will not necessarily lead you to the topic sentence? So maybe that's another kind of question that you might say. So what do you do with what? You better say, we don't use that. Uh, the best test to determine whether you have identified the topic sentence is to rephrase it as a question. This is another helpful hint. If the paragraph answers the question that you frame, you found the topic sentence. Okay. Summary support or transitional. Another technique that will lead you to the topic sentence is to identify what purpose other sentences in the paragraph serve. Kind of a process of elimination. Generally, sentences can be characterized as summary, support, or transitional. Summary sentences state a general idea or concept. As a rule, a topic sentence is a summary sentence, a concise, which is like you squeeze all the information in there, short and to the point, yet inclusive, which includes as much information as you can, an inclusive statement that expresses the general intent of the paragraph. A definition, the topic sentence is never support sentence. Support sentences provide the specific details and facts that give credibility to the author's point of view. Right, again, you can't just make a statement. You need support sentences. They give examples, explain arguments, offer evidence, or attempt to prove something as true or false. They are not meant to state generally what the author wants to communicate. They are intended to be specific, not conceptual in nature, specific. Transitional sentences move the author from one point to another. That's why they transition. They may be viewed as bridges. That's a good way to look at them. It's a bridge connecting one point to another. Connecting the paragraphs in a text, suggesting the relationship between what you just finished reading and what you are about to read. Good readers are attuned or pay attention to the signals such sentences provide. They are buzzers that scream, this is what you are going to find out next. Transitional sentences may also alert you to what you should have just learned. Unlike support sentences, transitional sentences provide invaluable and direct clues to identifying the topic sentence. Now we're going to move on to some examples of transitional signals. Any sentence that continues a progression of thought or succession of concepts is a transitional sentence. Such a sentence may begin with such as first, next, finally, or then, and indicate the before-after connection between changes, improvements, or alterations. Transitional sentences that begin in this way would raise these questions in your mind. This is what you should be thinking, in other words. Do I know what the previous examples were? What additional example am I about to learn? What was the situation prior to the change? Other transition statements suggest a change in argument or thought or an exception to a rule. These will generally be introduced by words like but, although, Though, uh, rather, however, or similar conjunctions that suggest an opposing thought. McDonald's Big Mac is delicious. However, I prefer 
Burger King's Whopper, right? Things like that. Okay. Such words ought to or should raise these questions. What is the gist or main meaning of the argument I just read? What will the argument I am about to read state or talk about? To what rule is the author offering an exception? In your effort to improve your reading, developing the ability to recognize the contrast between general, inclusive words and statements, summary sentences, and specific detail-oriented sentences, transitional or support sentences, is paramount. Paramount means of the utmost importance. And then we have here taking notes on the bottom. The final step towards grasping or understanding and retaining the main idea of any paragraph is taking notes. There are several traditional methods students employ, outlining, highlighting, mapping, and drawing concept trees. An exhaustive review of all these methods is not within the scope of this particular book, but for a complete discussion of note-taking techniques, be sure to read Get Organized another of the books in my How to Study program. But I'm not telling you to do that. That's on your own for enjoyment only. Okay. okay, that means we've made it to the questions. Yay. Okay. Again, I'm slicing these half and half, five questions for composition. And then it will be five questions for reading, if you haven't noticed that from the first week of class. So in the composition area, one first question, what must you always have in mind when writing? So what should you always think about? Again, are you thinking about that Big Mac? Are you thinking about the burrito? Are you thinking about LeBron James and the Lakers? What are you thinking about? That's not good things to think about when you have to write about different subjects. Two. What do you appeal to to be an effective writer? Yeah. AKA, which kind? It could be a little list there. Be careful. Might be more than one. Three, describe how you use ethos. So, see, I'm writing ethos here. You don't have to use ethos, but just describe how you use it. You just look it up. Four, describe how you use pathos. All right. You say, well, I buy a vacuum and then I uh, start mopping the floor and then I get a duster. No, not at all. No silliness, people. And then five, what does need to know your purpose mean? Are we talking about your purpose in life? And I want to be a doctor. No. We're just talking about your writing purpose for whatever assignment you have been given. Right? All right. We shall continue. Reading. Here's a, oh, I only gave you four. I'm being kind. So nine questions in total. It's not even the end of the quarter. I'm being kind. Oh, it's good. Okay. okay, number one. When you understand a reading's intent, you have a context to do what? So again, your little corn fuse, because you weren't paying attention. You just look this up. The reading, and you'll find this. Okay, I use the keywords to help you find the answer. Two, which are the four tools you need to identify the main idea? So, again, just letting you know some students write one thing here. Well, I'm asking for four things. Okay, so, again, the more you put, uh, the more points you'll get. Some, some teachers will just be, you didn't list the four points, it's completely absent, it's completely zero points. I don't care that you listed two. You did not put four, but I'll give you a few points for it. But hopefully you'll shoot to answer the complete question. Next three, what are the five, again, same rule applies, four or five, one word, helpful questions for analysis. So you're going to ask yourself these questions for analysis. And four, list the traditional methods of taking notes. What are they? How do you do them? Just list those things, okay? All right. All right.
right, so we've finished the uh, readings. Finish the questions, and we should be at the end of the road here for the second week. Yay. See what happens here. Oh, it goes black. Let me get out of here. Go to the previous. Oh, okay. Let me hit the uh, stop share. All right, so there we are again, folks. So, you know, thank you for sharing the January 16th, 2023. Lesson, second of the quarter. And uh, we all have this thing figured out for our next uh, quarter. Okay. I mean, our next uh, class. All right. Thank you much. Bye bye.